Now this video was shot a couple of days ago in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia and uh, one of the viewers was just driving past the hospital and as we'll see there's quite a queue of uh, ambulances waiting to get in because we know the situation in Russia is deteriorating and the queue goes on down the street unfortunately. Sad to think that there's probably very sick people in each of these ambulances who aren't able to uh, readily access the medical care they require. Okay. So, welcome. Indeed, welcome. It's uh, Saturday the 23rd of May. More on Russia, the situation in Russia shortly. Now, I just wanted to start off with a good news story. Uh, New Zealand, which is, uh, has done remarkably well in many ways. Now, to be fair, New Zealand did have quite a bit of warning that the rest of the world didn't have. But let's just have a look at a few, uh, a few of the figures from New Zealand just to see how things are going there. So there's been... Um, one, one day with uh, no new cases, but this was the first time in about four days there'd been new cases. So very few new cases cropping up in New Zealand, which is remarkably encouraging. 28 active cases in the country, uh, 1,500 total cases, nearly all recovered, thankfully. <clears throat> uh, 21 deaths. Now, to be fair, this death figure of 1.39% is... Highish, highish, and it's concerning because it probably is based now on fairly complete data from New Zealand. So, does that mean in quite a few places we can expect a death rate of one point three nine percent? Well, from the New Zealand data, yes, I think it does mean that. One person in hospital, uh, over a quarter of a million people tested in New Zealand. Now let's just uh, reinforce this by looking at some uh, graphics here. So this is the current active cases in New Zealand. So here we have active cases and here we have total cases. So obviously the total is going to keep on increasing. But we see they had this peak here and then it went down quite dramatically. So very encouraging reduction in active cases. And as we said at the moment that figure stands at uh, 28 as of the 23rd of May. Uh, daily cases, confirmed and probable cases. And again, we see new cases. One here, confirmed new case, but that was the first one for several days. Then there was about, what, two there, two or three there, and then nothing for a while. So very encouraging reduction in daily cases in New Zealand. Uh, current death rate, of course, that can never go down, but we can see it's been flat for some time, which is all we can hope for with death rates. So that's good. Um, this is the percentage of increase, so thankfully there's essentially no increase for some time. Um, oh, this was where people picked it up. So th th this is last port before New Zealand, so I just put that in out of interest. Most of the cases we see came from flights from the United States, then Australia, then United Arab Emirates. Um, but I put this on because the uh, gender of the patients, the male, female, there's more females testing positive than males. But this is the testing, of course. I would actually expect if that was the number of total cases, it to be almost exactly 50-50. Uh, because all the data we're getting now is that this disease affects men and women equally. So good news there from New Zealand. Now let's go on to the UK. Um, so in the UK, um, increasing number of cases, we know it's way higher than that. Deaths now, uh, nearly 35,000 deaths uh, in the UK attributed to COVID-19. Now the Office for National Statistics has been doing some surveys. And what they've been doing is they've been going around homes doing antigen surveys with swabs to look for the actual presence of the virus. It's what you would call cross-sectional data, what's going on today. 
And actually the cross section was from the 4th to the 17th of May. So what's going on in that period of time? And they went to uh, just over 7,000 households and they tested uh, 14,500 people. So it's a good sample size. And these were people from all over the country. And they're going to increase this to uh, 300,000 in the, in the next few months. So they're going to be doing very large spot testing at home. Now, at the moment, this testing of 14,500 people estimates that 0.25 of people in the country are currently infected in the community. So this is not people in hospital, not people in care homes. This is just people at home in the community. Now, what they didn't say was how many of those were getting symptoms. Now, that would have been interesting. I'll have to, hopefully, they'll start publishing that data. But um, what this means is of the 66 million people in the population, that means 165,000 in the UK have currently got the infection. I've actually got it now as we speak, actually testing positive for the virus. Now, positive tests in different age categories were all the same. Interesting, interesting, because we did look at data from Europe that said that children were less likely to be infected. That was actually antibody studies. But when we're actually doing antigen studies here, People from all age groups are equally likely to be infected. So young children, teenagers, young adults, older adults, middle age, old adults, all with the same probability of being infected. But of course, not with the same probability of developing complicated disease or dying, of course. But this is what I've, oft, I've, I've actually suspected this pretty well all the way through, that everyone is equally likely to be infected. And that's what this data is showing. And the male-female split of positive tests are exactly the same. So there's no gender division here in who is likely to get the condition, which we basically already knew. But it's always nice to have these things confirmed. No difference in infected people between patient-facing and non-patient-facing roles. So quite a few of the people that they surveyed worked in hospitals or worked in care homes with patients. And they found no difference in infection rate between those people who were patient facing, nurses, doctors, people working in hospitals or care homes, with the general population. So not what you'd expect. You'd expect that more people would pick the virus up at work who were patient facing, but it's not what the data shows. So nurses, doctors, carers around the country, no more likely to be infected than anyone who is any other occupation, bricklayer or whatever. And now the Office for National Statistics estimate there's new 9,000 new, 9, new infections per day. 9,000 new cases per day. People getting infected at the moment. So we see this virus has by no means gone away. People are still getting infected. But my COVID-19 symptom, symptom tracker app, well, it's not mine, I use it. So I'm, one of the, <laughs> I'm one of the nearly 4 million people that use it. Um, they estimate it, it's the, it's the, uh, the, London, the London app. They estimate that 9,900 9, people, uh, new people got the infection in, in, uh, today, uh, yesterday, yesterday in the UK. So, so it's, not, it's not too far out. I mean, they are vaguely consistent figures given the margin of error. So what we see is still quite a few people catching the infection every day in the UK. Now, the, the new strategy of um, track, trace, isolate at the moment, we've recruited um, enough trackers to trace 10,000 cases per day. So this is manageable at the current rate. And this is without the app. This is just human legwork doing this. So this is looking promising because we want to contain local outbreaks by isolating individual cases. And of course, this is what we should have been doing all along, but now we are doing it and we are flat out on that strategy. So this is encouraging. It's just a case of how long it's all going to take. Now, uh, one more new, good news story from the UK. A 20 minute test is now being developed. Now, it's currently being trialled in Basins, Basingstoke Hospital in southern England, and it's looking very good. So it's just like a little machine. It's about, it's about the size of a big shoebox. And you can take it to places and test people. And it gives you a result in 20 minutes. And it's looking as reliable 
as the other tests, as the PCR tests. So this is remarkably encouraging if this trial in Basingstoke uh, works out. So testing at the point of care, testing directly from a swab into the machine, fully portable machine, and the results, according to uh, the, the people running the trial, are comparable with the, uh, the gold standard PCR tests. So that was uh, interesting and, and hopeful. Now I wanted to show you this graph of daily confirmed COVID-19 deaths in different countries. And as always, we check the scale and we see it's a logarithmic scale. So uh, 0, 10, 100, 1,000 cases as the cases increase there. And this is days since five daily deaths first reported. And what I wanted to bring to our attention here was the shape of these or the direction of these lines. Now, as we know, Italy, uh, the death rate is, is going down. So we would hope that the Italian data would carry on doing this. Carry on going down. Now, the United Kingdom, again, the death rate is going down, albeit not as steeply as we'd like, but if we try and give a bit of a best fit line there, say something like that, it's still a good downward trend. So, encouraging. But I just wanted to highlight three countries I'm particularly concerned about now. And we saw Russia at the start with all those ambulances in St. Petersburg. India and Brazil. Now, if we look at the trend here in Brazil, that trend is undoubtedly going up. So the daily deaths in Brazil are most definitely on an upward trend. And the World Health Organization has said Brazil is currently the epicenter of the pandemic. But if we look at the direction of India, now India it's going up as well, so that's the kind of trajectory line for India. And Russia, it's going up even steeper. So this is the kind of trajectory line for Russia. How high will this go? We don't know. So encouraging trends there from the United Kingdom and especially from Italy, but worrying trends in Brazil, India and Russia. Now this video is from India, it was taken in uh, Tamil Nadu. And it's that bus station we saw a picture of a few days ago that's being taken over as a market. So we see that individual people have like got one bus stop each for their market. Which is great because we've now got good social distancing. Indian markets are very often not so well segregated. So it's excellent to see these very helpful local initiatives. And as well as that, it's all outside, so any viral loads will be greatly diluted, much safer than an indoor supermarket. Now, moving on to the United States, we see um, 1.6 million confirmed cases and tragically, it's not going to be too long before we get to the 100,000 deaths. But I just want to put this in some sort of context before we go on. So what we have here is this is the deaths per thousand of the population. In other words, the per capita deaths. And we see that in the UK there's been 54.86 deaths per 100,000 of the population. But Belgium's been the highest. Belgium's lost over 80 people per 100,000 of the population. Then Spain, then the United Kingdom, then Italy, then France, then Sweden. And the United States actually is way down there. It's 39.34. So the per capita deaths, the deaths per 100,000 in the United States, are still lower than quite a lot of other countries that we see here. 
Belgium, Spain, United Kingdom, Italy, France, Sweden, Netherlands, Ireland. So I just think it's important to see that in context, but it doesn't alter the fact it's still an awfully large number. So getting on for 100,000 deaths. Now nearly everywhere in the United States is starting to ease restrictions now. Now just as an example, Alabama. Alabama began reopening 10 days ago. And they are up to about 14,000 cases now. But in Montgomery, Alabama, the hospitals and the ITUs are full, which is concerning. So even with the amount of cases now, and the cases are still rising, the hospitals are full now. So what this means, the situation in Montgomery, Alabama, I suspect is going to be worse next week than it is now. And now the hospitals and ITUs are full. This is concerning and quite where... Alabama goes from here I'm not entirely clear now Stephen Reed who is the mayor of Montgomery said if you need an ITU bed you are in trouble and I was just reminded of that situation that we saw in the Soviet Union where sick people were queuing in ambulances outside the hospital so it seems if you need an ITU bed or even a hospital bed in Montgomery Alabama that could be an issue so Upcoming hotspots that could be similar to Montgomery, Alabama in the next week or so, judging by the increase in the number of cases. Dallas, Houston in Texas, Tennessee and Florida. So I've got this email from Florida from a Floridian who's contacted me. Florida is not getting it right. Many people are back to normal, sitting together at restaurants and bars. Way too soon. Wife and I wear masks, but many don't. We just stay away from people as much as possible. So I'm expecting to see more cases all over the United States, and particularly in these areas are the current, perhaps next hotspot, similar to Montgomery, Alabama. And, and make no mistake, if there's no medical care available, some of the people that would have survived will not survive. Now, also in the States, University of Washington has published some research, which is interesting. And it says screening is more effective in care homes than clinical presentation. So we know that the virus affects older people in care homes disproportionately. But what this data is actually showing is actually, well, no. To get an accurate figure of how many people in care homes are actually infected with the virus, we need to do testing, screening, need to test for it. That's more effective than, more accurate than clinical presentation. So what this means is that even in care homes, there's a great amount of asymptomatic carriers. So what this means is, even in the high risk groups, the people that we know are high risk, the elderly and those with comorbidities, it still looks like more of those are asymptomatic than are symptomatic. So I thought that was particularly interesting data, that even in these high-risk groups, there's an awful lot of people that are completely asymptomatic. This disease seems to pick who it wants to make sick and who it wants to kill. And uh, very often we're not sure what the difference is. Now, Mr. President... Uh, Trump was visiting a Ford plant in Michigan and he did wear a mask, I'm pleased to say. Um, but then he took it off to see the press. Now, quite why he did that, I've no idea. I would have thought, I would have thought he wore a mask as per company policy, which I'm delighted to know it's the Ford company policy. And this Ford plant's making uh, ventilators at the moment. So that's good. Um, but quite why the president took his mask off for the press, I don't know. I would have thought to leave the mask on for the press would be a good example. But uh, that was his decision. And he's also saying that houses of worship are essential. Um, now, I would appeal to all Christians in the United States not to go to church at the moment. I would appeal to all Muslims not to go to the mosque in the United States at the moment. I would appeal to all Hindus not to go to the temple in the United States at the moment. It's too early and the world is replete with examples of spread as a result of religious gatherings. In my view, 
any religious group that goes back to communal meeting as of now, as of the end of May, um, would be bringing their institution into disrespect. Um, I feel strongly about that. Um, you can pray at home, you can watch online services. It's too early to be going back to very often very busy, crowded church, mosque, temple situations. Just be a little patient for a little while. Now, Italy. Uh, we know the cases and the deaths in, in Italy. It's, uh, it's been a bad place. Now, this was interesting. This, this study caught my eye from uh, the Milan metropolitan area. And it's about sero prevalence. In other words, they were looking for the antibodies in the serum of the blood. So the, you take a blood sample and you uh, look at the, uh, the serum part of the blood. That, that's the other part that's not the cells. So uh, SARS coronavirus 2 infection in healthy asymptomatic adults. So this was looking for the presence of the antibody in people that had no symptoms, asymptomatic adults. Cross-sectional study during the um, outbreak and they were chest testing for the presence of immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin G. They're the two types of antibodies they were looking for. Uh, now, they were taking it from a blood centre, a blood transfusion centre, and it was a random sample of blood donors from the 24th of February to the 8th of April 2020, and they looked at 789 samples, so it's a good size. Now, the test had a 98.3% specificity and 100% sensitivity. Now, let's just remind ourselves what these mean. Specificity means that the test is specific to the virus, therefore false positives are unlikely. Unlikely to say the virus is there if it is not. Sensitivity means the test is sensitive to the presence of the virus, therefore false, <coughs> false negatives are unlikely. Unlikely to say the virus is not there if it is. So anyway, it's a good quality test. Now, what they found out, and remember this is asymptomatic adults, so to begin with, there was 4.6% infected in the LAN area, then it went up to 7.1, then it finished off at 10.8 at the end of the study time. So we see that asymptomatic adults were being infected with COVID-19 in Milan. And this is the kind of figure that we're looking at in, in quite a few places around the world now that have had infection. Conclusion, SARS coronavirus 2 infection was already circulating in Milan at the start of the outbreak, so that was already there near the start. But more got infected and many did remain asymptomatic, so asymptomatic adults definitely getting the infection. And from what I understand, from reviewing the current data at the moment, that means that these adults are very likely to be immune. More on that in the next video when we look at... Uh, vaccination and immunity but the data at the moment to me is indicating that these people are now likely to be immune for how long we don't know now sweden we did look at sweden quite a bit um increasing cases increasing deaths but not but not much that the rate of increase of deaths is now going down quite dramatically in sweden so obviously the total number of deaths is increasing but the rate of increase is decreasing now, Sweden, how should we put it, has not been very locked down. There has been social distancing. They do rely on personal responsibility and people kind of do what they want. But we expressed great fear for the Swedish experiment and we did videos of this. So let's see what the results of the Swedish experiment are now. And I think this is interesting. So here we see, again, this graph of deaths per 100,000 of the population. And we see Belgium has more deaths per 100,000 than Sweden. So does Spain. So does the United Kingdom. So does Italy. So does France. Then we have Sweden there. More deaths per capita than the United States, but unfortunately we know that's still increasing. So are there more deaths per capita in Sweden than France, Italy, United Kingdom, Spain, Belgium? No. Now, fair enough. Um, the Netherlands, Ireland have done better, as has Switzerland. But what we haven't seen is the complete disaster in Sweden that we did fear. 
Now, having said that, the deaths in care homes do seem particularly high. So care home residents do seem to have paid quite a big price for the Swedish approach. But I've been struggling to think why is the per capita death rate in Sweden so low? And the answer is no one really knows at this stage. But I'm just wondering, the Swedes tend to do a lot of things outside, don't they? And we look, the, the data we looked at this morning from the uh, Centre for Disease Control in the United States, stressing that it's person to person transmission, droplet to droplet transmission, which is not the only mode of transmission, but the main driver of transmission globally. Well, maybe in Sweden, if they spend more time outside, the viral loads are diluted. So I conclude that outdoor activities are safer than indoor activities, especially if there's the social distancing. That's what the Swedish data seems to be saying. So I thought that was quite interesting on Sweden there. So they haven't done as badly as we thought. Now, Brazil, uh, again, we looked at the cases in Brazil that are rising, uh, rising quite sharply, unfortunately, as we, as we saw there. Steep increase in the rate of deaths in Brazil. And uh, the World Health Organization is now saying Brazil is the world, is the, well, South America generally is the world's epicenter. At St. Paulo, people are still going to the beach. Now, the city beach is closed, but people are still going. Um, the compliance of the population in Brazil does not seem to have been very good at the moment. And in São Paulo, ITU is close to capacity, so I expect to be at capacity in the next day or two. So death rate in Brazil carrying on increasing. Afghanistan is quite hard to get data from. More cases. Um, now, um, Afghan Afghanistan, I'm worried about. The, the, it is locked down, but it's not strict. People tend to go out and kind of do their own thing. And I did see at the end of Ramadan, some mosques were absolutely packed. Close packed worshippers at the mosque, close to each other, guaranteed spread situation. Again, this pattern that very often the virus has been spread in religious buildings. Now, I don't know how it works with the Islamic uh, practices, but if they were to pray outside, that would be so much safer than praying inside. Same for churches, if we could have outdoor church services. And ideally, we'd, we want complete social distancing, of course, but if you must... If you only need to have services at the moment, then we need this distancing and outside will be better. Now, Qatar has suffered quite badly for the size of the country. And uh, they have imposed mandatory uh, mask wearing on pain of imprisonment. And it's quite su su substantial punishment. So I just think that shows the importance of wearing masks. Why are we not doing that everywhere? We looked at this yesterday. We've looked at this several times now. People should be wearing masks in public places. Um, Yemen, war-tone country, health system has effectively collapsed. It's certainly down by 50%. So this may be the first country that we see of the effects of this pandemic with no functioning healthcare system. And I suspect what we will see is very high case fatality rates. Other countries to follow, unfortunately. Indonesia, likewise, increasing cases. Jakarta shops are shops are supposed to close, but the people keep opening. Shop, shoppers keep attending, and it's not a good situation. Spread is happening there. Now let's look at a few viewers from around the world. This is Callum, who watches in London, in the south of England. Well, it's south to me anyway. Thank you, Callum, for watching in London. This is uh, Camillo, who watches in Colombia. So we jump from uh, London to uh, Colombia. Brilliant. Such is the power of the internet. Glad to see you watching in Colombia. This is Carol in British Columbia in Canada. Wearing a mask to protect other people. Excellent. Well done, Carol. This is uh, Katua in Indonesia who's clearly made himself a mask that matches his shirt. Very stylish. And is also taking vitamin D and watching my videos. So thank you, Kato, from Indonesia. And this is Charlie and John. 
Charlie, John, and we're missing one person, aren't we? So, uh, but anyway, I'm, <laughs> nice to see families watching in Bolton. And last time I checked, that was in Lancashire. Great to see people watching as a family. This is uh, Chitter from uh, Toronto, who's pleased to see is taking uh, vitamin D. And I'm pleased to see you're watching in Toronto, Canada, Chitter. Uh, this is Chris and uh, Marlena. And I'm not sure where you are. So it's, it's Marina, isn't it? Not Marlena. Silly me. Chris and Marina. I have problems reading names. Anyway, I'm delighted you're watching. <laughs> Wherever you are. Sorry, I don't know where you are. Is it Brazil? There's a Brazil thing there. Don't know. Anyway, please be watching. Uh, this is Cindy and Matt in Kansas. And they found time for a video on their 25th wedding anniversary, which is very moving that you've bothered with me on your wedding anniversary. So congratulations on your first 25 years, Cindy and Matt in Kansas. David, this is David, this is Jim, the parrot. Now Jim's 20, Jim's 35 years old apparently. And apparently he was objecting to those red hamsters I had on the other day, but uh, hopefully he's better now. And they uh, both watched together in Indiana. Great to know people are watching in the States. Ah, now, this someone sent this in. Um, it's just a matter of time till people start putting advertising slogans on face masks. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> uh, this is James in Denver, which is in Colorado, who has made a very uh, elegant looking face mask. Now she did. Uh, she did tell me that this is the dress face mask. She's got other more practical ones she wears outside. So thank you, James from uh, Denver. This is uh, Laurie from uh, Paris. Very colourful mask, Laurie. Excellent. Well done. Glad to know you're watching in France. Uh, this is Nick who made pictures of the hamsters after that hamster experiment we were talking about the other day. And the hamsters that wore masks didn't infect the other hamsters. This is Zeta who watches in Lancashire. Just south of me in uh, the northern part of England. <laughs> 